Greetings, my name is Christopher Paisley, a Philadelphia public school teacher for Inside White Fragility. Today I'd like to talk about the battle to keep the book White Fragility out of the Okaloosa County School District in Florida. Now, apparently there was some brouhaha going on because an English teacher in the Choctawachi High School, if I said the name correctly, wanted to bring in the book White Fragility into an English class. All right, so this English teacher wanted to use Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, in an English class. And apparently there was a complaint by a parent. Uh, the teacher did not go through the proper uh, procedure to get it into the curriculum. And the district basically said, you cannot, you cannot use this book. Interestingly, in the paper, uh, in a local newspaper, the, the headline was, The novel, White Fragility, is pulled from a Chalk Tawachi High School English class. The novel White Fragility. All right, everybody knows that White Fragility is not a novel. Okay, White, White Fragility is a nonfiction uh, book by Robin DiAngelo. Um, but yet, the local press and even the school board seem to refer to this book as a novel. So that kind of tells you everything you need to know about the knowledge on the subject. And if you look at the school board meeting, which we're going to see some clips of the school board meeting about this, you're going to see that it becomes apparent that very few people in the room even read the book, but everybody has an opinion on the book and whether or not you should be using it or not. So what happened was the district decided that the book couldn't be used, and then, of course, as soon as that happened, a bunch of activist groups, including a chapter of BLM, got involved. Um, they rallied around. They went to the school board. They got a petition going, and uh, they did, now they're demanding that the book, be, of course, be taught in, the, in an English class. Okay, this nonfiction book to be taught about race that has little to do with their curriculum to be put into this English class. So there was a second uh, article, and the headline read, Okaloosa School Board Hears Public Comments About White Fragility. And on that was the uh, school board meeting. And then from there, there was a petition, like I had said, a, pet a petition was put out by the um, Niceville, uh, I believe, Niceville County Black Lives Matter chapter put out this this petition and now there's 1300 signatures of course and they want this back they want this into the school now so the interesting thing about all this like i said is many people in that room which we're going to watch in the school board ha have never read the book and i'm pretty sure i'm not I'm, I'm not exactly positive if the school board uh the superintendent the superintendent's name is Marcus Chambers i'm not sure if if superintendent Marcus Chambers read the book or not i know one of the resolutions was that they were going to read the book to see if it's appropriate. But I, I don't know at this point if they had read it. But what I want to do now is I just want to go into a little bit of the content of the book so you can see how completely inappropriate this book, White Fragility, is for high school students, especially in an English class. Okay, so first of all, the whole concept of Robin D'Angelo's white fragility, this idea that white people are so fragile and that when the topic of race comes up, you know, they get argumentative, they get defensive, they completely unravel and they suffer from this kind of this uh, certain, I guess you could call it ailment, which is white fragility. Th this, this, this theory by Robin D'Angelo has never been tested in terms of a, a true scientific hypothesis. She's never fully tested this, okay? She, she gives her own anecdotal observations and qualitative evidence about why this is true, but she never did any quantitative, real, legitimate scientific study on this. So basically, it's just identity politics. It's just a lot of politics being pumped in and being masked as science. And she even admits, admits as much. In the beginning of the book, she says that it's all about identity politics. She freely admits it and she says that all all of uh, America's racial progress has come from identity politics so she makes no bones about it and of course they want this into the school because that's the plan all right so it's untested um, at the base of this thing it, it, it's not unifying it basically is very very polarizing it basically stereotypes and generalizes all white people it stereotypes and generalizes people of color and it states that all whites are inherently racist of course so if you were going to read this book and your child was in the school you would say okay you're so your child's a racist do you accept that that you're a racist 
uh, when it comes to children of color and people of color, they're all oppressed. So the white people are the oppressors. The uh, people of color are the oppressed. Um, white people suffer from this anti-blackness, which is really, um, D'Angelo uses some very strong language, and I want to read some excerpts from her chapter six, anti-blackness. I believe that in the white mind, black people are Black people are the ultimate racial other, and we must grapple with this relationship for it is a foundational aspect of the racial socialization underlying white fragility. Creating a separate and inferior black race simultaneously created the superior white race. One concept could not exist without the other. In this sense, whites need black people. Blackness is essential to the creation of white identity. We see anti-black sentiment and how quickly images of brutality toward black children are justified by white assumption that it must have been deserved. There is a curious satisfaction in the punishment of black people. The smiling faces of the white crowd picnicking at lynchings in the past and the satisfied approval of white people observing mass incarceration and extinction in the present. White righteousness when inflicting pain on African Americans is evident in the glee the white collective derives from blackface and depictions of blacks as apes and gorillas. Alright, so this is what they want in the school. Alright, so there are just some little excerpts from white fragility and how toxic this thing is it has nothing to do with unity it has everything to do with identity politics it has everything to do with polarizing people by identity okay so as we're going to see there was a school board meeting recently held and there were several people who spoke in front of the board the first gentleman um he worked in uh the field of college and career readiness and he works with schools to develop pathways to employment Okay, and what he talks about is he believes that kids need to learn critical thinking skills, they need to have the ability to work in groups, and they need to learn good communication. And he says that um, White Fragility would be a great book because they'd be presented with these ideas, and it would be great because they, would, they could discuss them in a critical format. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Name is Dr. Gregory Seaton. Address is P.O. Box 728, Mary Esther, Florida, 32569. Right. Uh, really wanted to uh, address uh, the issue around uh, the book White Fragility uh, that is no longer being allowed to be taught. Uh, if the facts are as they stand on their face, uh, I think the district is missing an opportunity to develop skills around college and career readiness. In my day job, what I do is work with regions, educational systems, secondary ed, and post-secondary ed to develop pathways to employment. Uh, as you know, what employers are looking for in terms of college and career readiness, uh, critical thinking, ability to work in groups, and communication. Uh, what this book would allow is, one, allow for students to be presented with ideas that they could think about and discuss in a critical format, Two, the issue of race is not going anywhere anytime soon. All right, but the tragedy of the situation is anybody who's dealt with Robin D'Angelo in terms of being in on her workshops or listening to her workshops or reading her books, it's very clear. There is no there is no forum for communication. All right. There is no forum for critical thinking. There is no forum to work in groups. Because if you're talking about working in groups to solve racial problems, if you've been to a Robin D'Angelo workshop, you'll know that she splits you into affinity groups. She segregates you by race. So the whites are in a group and people of color are split into their groups and it's very polarizing and there is no there is no real problem solving going on what 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 goes on is people are especially white people they're just supposed to listen they're supposed to listen uh d'angelo speaks the dogma is given the scripts are given and, the, and basically the white people in the group are supposed to shake their head and just say yes if if you challenge if you disagree if you have an alternative point of view of course you suffer from white fragility so there is no critical thinking going on it's pure indoctrination all right we had another uh, spokesperson. Now, this uh, person was a professor of humanities at, Nor at Northwest Florida State College and a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the school. Mr. Chair, uh, members, superintendent, I'm Dr. David Simmons. Um, my address is 111 Fair Avenue, Niceville, Florida. And I too would just like to add my voice to what we just heard. Um, 
of the importance of books like White Fragility being told. I'm a professor of humanities at Northwest Florida State College um, and a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee that's there. Um, two years ago, we had a book club, a college-wide book club, using White Fragility. And we met several times over several weeks. We had students and faculty and administrators were there, and I wish you could have been there to see the lives that were changed as we talked about the problem of systemic racism and the eyes that were opened and the students that told me, thank you so much for doing this. Since I teach students that come from, from your district, um, I really want students who are prepared to talk about issues like race and class and gender and sexuality, and not only so that they can do well in their higher education, but also so that they can <clears throat> interact in the world in a more empathetic and loving and compassionate way. All right. Again, so so the reality of the situation is that this the, the white fragility, the white fragility model, is not about unity, is not about coming together, it's not about compassion, it's not about love, it's about blaming, it's about accusation. Even D'Angelo says it herself. Niceness is not anti-racist. Okay, white fragility and anti-racism is not about being nice. It's about provoking agitating and kind of shocking whites out of their supposed privileged bubble so that we can bring about change. So the next woman who spoke in front of the school board was a family practice provider, whatever that is, and here's her story. My name is Misty Schneidwin. I reside at 105 Oakwood Circle in Niceville, Florida. I am a family practice provider. I have two children who graduated from Niceville, one in 2016 with high honors and one as valedictorian in 2018. A teacher at Choctaw High School, as you probably know, has recently been trying to discuss topics from the book White Fragility. I sent all five school board members an email on Friday morning outlining my concerns related to this situation. I hope that one of you will take the time to reach back to me with answers to those questions. I'm not here tonight to discuss whether this book should or should not be approved. That will play out with time. I'm here tonight because I don't want the feedback that was received from the original parent to be the only voice that's heard. I learned of this matter after a concerned parent reached out to the Okaloosa Democrats. They reached out to me and I reached out to the youth that are involved with the Niceville BLM movement. They are the ones that have raised money to put signs up around Niceville, uh, billboards up around Niceville, as well as the first one up in Fort Walton today. Um, they put together a petition that has so far received over 1,300 signatures. That's in less than a week's time. Um, I would like to take the rest of my time to read you some of the comments that we've gathered on that petition. These comments come from current and former students and their parents, current and former educators and their administrators, current board members and pastors, and other concerned citizens who want to do nothing more than arm our youth with the tools and knowledge necessary to help make the, better, the world a better place for everyone. Um, I'll read the name and location of each commenter. Leslie Fuller, Niceville, Florida. I think it's important to discuss topics of race, particularly in regards to the history of our country. Books like White Fragility help white people understand the issues that minorities face and what role the majority culture plays in racism, whether overt or implied. Our young people should be able to have honest conversations about this so that true unity and change can come to our country. Okay, so if you go through what she actually said, she said that a concerned family member had reached out to the Okaloosa Democrats, who then reached out to this woman, who then reached out to the Niceville Black Lives Matter chapter, who then decided to put together this petition to force this book into the schools. We're now talking about these outside activist organizations that are getting involved in this, just like the professor from the outside. Now we're talking about these activist organizations getting involved. Okay, and the interesting thing is that one woman said that one of the spokespeople on the petition had said it's, it's, it's about true unity and change, true unity and change to come to our country. There's, there's nothing in white fragility that has anything remotely to do with unity and love. It has everything to do with, again, polarizing, agitating, provoking, and, and really um, it's just divisive. All right, the next uh, person who spoke was a former student and parent, okay, and here's what she had to say. In my time 
In Okaloosa County School System, I was required to read Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, written in 1852, that had very derogatory words in it, such as Mammy and Piccadilly. We were required to read Adventures of Tom Sawyer, written in 1876 by Mark Twain, and it had the N-word in it several times. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1884, had the N-word over 219 times in it, and that was required reading for us. The N-word was there until 2011 when it was replaced. One of another classics, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. My daughters read it at Choctaw. My daughters read it at Niceville. It had the N-word 50 times. It seems that the N-word really doesn't bother anybody but the people that it's directed towards. This is part of that white fragility that we're talking about. You know, I don't think that a lot of people realize that Okaloosa County, Escambia County, and Santa Rosa County, we have the highest incarceration rates in the pipeline to prison for our school districts. And a lot of that has to do with race. A lot of that has to do with us talking directly because when a black <clears throat> woman talks directly, we're always perceived to be angry. And that's not always the point. I think that race plays a lot in this community. All right. The interesting thing that she brings up is her comparison. All right. She talks about Uncle Tom's Cabin. She talks about Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And then she talks about To Kill a Mockingbird. To equate Robin D'Angelo's white fragility with these classic pieces of literature is just funny. Okay. No offense to the woman. Okay. I can see she's a member of the community. She cares. All due respect to her. But it's interesting that she talks about this and she makes a comparison. Now, I know the language in those books, is it, it, it can be offensive, and that's a whole other issue in terms of revisionist and censorship, revisionism and censorship. But the fact that she makes this comparison with these books, it's funny. And But there's another level to this. If you look at a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, that is a very, very, very powerful powerful narrative on stopping racism when you look at the trial and you look at the statement that harper lee was making about stopping racism in the country that is a very powerful and important book robin d'angelo comes from another angle that was more a book about unity that was more a book about understanding and courage and sticking up for people whereas uh white fragility is more of, again it's more of a divisive polarizing uh book based on accusations not celebration but accusations and chastising okay then we had a woman who called in and she was of course another outsider she was the ceo of a group called speak justice um hello my name is sonia vasquez my address is 415 baker avenue northwest fort walton beach florida um i just also as well wanted to speak on the book being uh removed white fragility um i have an organization here as well, I'm called Speak Justice. I'm actually the CEO of Speak Justice. And what that group does, I have a platform where I have people to come on and speak about equality, racism, police reform, and um, equality. Um, so I think at a time like this, um, I noticed through my reading that it took one parent to complain that they didn't want their child to actually be exposed to the teaching of racism. And I, I feel that's kind of absurd because, I mean, there's we have hundreds of other parents that are concerned and want their kids to be educated on racism. Okay. Now, notice the language that she is talking about in this phone call, okay? One parent didn't want their child to be taught about racism. They keep framing this as if it's 
people don't want the kids to be taught about racism. It's not that they don't want to be taught about racism. It's that they don't want to be called, that they don't want their children to be lambasted or stereotyped or generalized as a racist, as being anti-black, as being privileged. There's all these things. It's very divisive. It's not simply talking about multiculturalism or inclusion or racism. It's being accused. In a way, it's being bullied. And then if you disagree, again, you're being labeled and stereotyped as having white fragility. All right. So in the end of this, the uh, superintendent, Marcus Chambers, he made his decision. First of all, I do want to say, you know, as it pertains to uh, racism, as it pertains to discrimination, um, I think each and every one of us up here knows that uh, we do not believe in our school district that there is any place for this type of behavior. But what we also know is that when it comes to instruction, when it comes to what is taught in our schools, um, there are processes in place. And when it comes to novels that are taught in school, so for example, at the high school level, um, at the beginning of the year, there are novels that are set aside for each school. And at the beginning of the year, um, at the high school level, uh, many of our high schools will even designate that a senior class is gonna teach this novel an 11th grade class is going to teach this novel. But if you end up going um, in a different direction or you want to choose a new book to be taught, then that book then goes through a process as well. And, for example, um, at Choctahatchee High School, there, there's a process by which a teacher would go through if they want to teach a novel that's outside of what was already established and agreed upon by an English department. Um, Looking into this situation, uh, there appears to be that a process was not gone through in terms of this, uh, this book, White Fragility. Now, I think it's important, and I'm just going to say this because um, I'm just, just going to be you know, kind of blunt and matter of fact with this. When you're in a school district, and, and whether it's a novel or whether it's what's being taught, um, you have to have some checks and balances in terms of how you do things. And I'm not even talking about the book White Fragility. I'm just talking about content or novels. So it's important that you do have a process at the school level. So just anything and everything isn't um, brought into a school district. And I'm not even talking about race, not even talking about the book White Fragility. Again, the interesting thing is he keeps talking about novels. In the local newspaper, this was talked about as being a novel. Now, I, I think he mentioned it as a book, but if, if people are still talking about this as if it were a novel, that right there shows you that there's some gap in between the understanding of what this book is. This book is not a novel, okay? This book is not a novel. It's being compared to novels. As you saw, the one parent compared it to, to uh, Mockingbird. She compared it to Huck Finn. She compared it to Uncle Tom's Cabin. They're novels. This is not a novel. Okay, hello, this is not a novel. Robin D'Angelo's book is not a novel, and it does not belong in an English class. All right, and just like the superintendent said, Marcus Chambers said, there is a process. You have to go through the process. You have to decide if this curriculum is going to work. You have to decide if it's going to fit into the state standards. And in an English class, when you're talking about this kind of thing, this book absolutely positively has no place in an English classroom and to be honest with you it has no place in a in a in a, in a high school anywhere in the country because it's a divisive polarizing inappropriate book where if you actually take the time to read the book and you see the language do you want your child in school being stereotyped as a racist hey is your is your is your child a racist is your child the privileged or the oppressed is your child the one who is the oppressor, or are they the one who is suffering from the brutality? Is your child the one who is the, 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 the you know, using this polarizing anti-blackness, or is your child the one who's the victim? There's nothing unifying about this. So the bottom line is this. This school district needs to think long and hard about whether or not they want a book like this in their district, okay? When you look inside the pages of White Fragility, it is not simply a discussion about race. It's polarizing, it's divisive, and it's completely inappropriate in a high school classroom.